A package came today after I got home from work from MFJ Enterprises in Starkville, Mississippi. Now what could this be, I wonder? I have a sneaking suspicion I know what this might be, but let's open it up and find out. This is something I've been wanting for a long time. Now I want to build my own custom unit eventually. This will get me by for now, and uh, I hope a lot of the old timers won't give me too much grief about this. But what we have here by the company Veritronics is an electronic kit, and uh, they have a lot of these to pick from. But the one that I selected is an AM radio transmitter kit. This has all the parts in it to build an AM radio transmitter. And it is compliant with Part 15 of the FCC. Uh, you don't have to have a license or any kind of crap like that for a transmitter like this because it's under 100 milliwatts output with a six foot antenna. So you do not have to have any kind of in, uh, yeah, license. FCC won't come knocking down your doors. Um, they ask that you respect other uh, stations on their respective channels. Try not to outpower them, overpower them, be respectful of the AM band. Swearing, cussing, cursing, blah, blah, blah. You know, use your common sense when you're on this thing. So, what we have here is a basic circuit board. All the parts are laid out. They did a rather nice job laying this out. You can see all the components are marked out on the board. And the plate through holes have been nicely done. They're very clean. In this bag we have all of our little microprocessors here and here. We have our uh, small capacitors, our large capacitors, a few resistors, there's our crystal, a couple potentiometers and some adjusters. This bag here we have our, our uh, our power switch. Uh, we have our RCA input, our antenna. This is the six foot coil of wire that they have you use as a straight antenna. A few chokes. Uh, we have some jumpers in here. Now this kit comes, uh, you, know, you have to assemble it yourself for thirty dollars and it also comes with a box that you can put it into or you can go to Radio Shack and customize your own box. I wanted this thing to look like it properly should so I put out the extra fifteen dollars. I think it's a little ridiculous for a plastic, I guess a metal case I should say. Uh, so altogether shipping um, it can come to about sixty two dollars for this unit. And uh, the nice thing is you can broadcast from 530 up to 750 kilohertz. I know the band only goes to 1710. I should say 530 to 1750 it says. The band only goes to 1710. Uh, any kind of input, line level, or volume input can be uh, used with this unit. And it runs on uh, multiple voltages of 9 to 14 volts. Uh, they want you to have a input voltage for this thing to be at least 12 volts 1 amp. And this is a model VEC-1290K. And the cabinet is a VEC-1290KC. So, in the back of the book, here's what our our cabinet will look like. It's kind of bleeding through there, isn't it? Here's what our cabinet will look like when all said and done. Our enclosure, I should say, is what they rightfully call it. Here's our schematic of how this thing works. They do a very good job of laying out um, all your parts, uh, a good checklist. They give you your go-throughs on uh, what you'll need. You know, like there's a, a nice parts diagram. And your check-off list as you install them, solder up, and whatnot. And uh, looks like a very, very well thought out unit. Um, 
So we're going to start putting this together tomorrow morning so uh, we can start using it and uh, hopefully it will turn out to be a good investment. Time will tell though, huh? Good morning guys. We're going to get started on this AM radio transmitter kit this morning and I got some tools laid out here in front of y'all and myself that uh, will benefit our uh, building of this model VEC 1290 AM transmitter. Now first and foremost what I did was put two pieces of uh, white poster board on my bench and taped them down. That way I can see everything that's laid out on this bench. Um, if anything rolls back into the corners or maybe off to the edges I might not see it you know but with this white poster board on this brown background that my bench is just a, it's a, like a fiberboard top I'll be able to see stuff a little bit easier and uh, look at the resistors and parts. I mean, so far everything seems to show up pretty good against it. You know, the, the circuit board, I can see it really nice up against it. So that's going to work out great. You always try to keep your work area clean, well lit, have all your tools right at hand, what you need. You know, experience proves this. I'm not just saying that for myself, but I've heard that from several other people that uh, build or restore radios, build kits, you know, do whatever they do. Second most important thing I want to add this morning is your soldering iron. This kit can be built with a 30 to 60 watt soldering iron. Mine goes 20 low, 40 high, so I've got it set to 40. That might be a little bit more heat than what I want. I'm just going to have to be careful. I've cleaned the tip, sanded it down, took all the old solder off, filed it down with a, uh, a triangular type file. And it's really good for getting there and cleaning that all up. And I, I took a uh, some real fine grit emery cloth and then I polished this up to where it was good and clean and shiny again and uh, we'll clean that tip and flux it and uh, pull the solder on there to be good to go which leads us to our solder this kit recommends using a .31 diameter 6040 rosin core solder um, this is a Radio Shack brand catalog I think it has a catalog number on it somewhere I don't see it. It used to have a catalog number on this stuff. Oh, there it is. 64-005. It's a light duty 6040 rosin core uh, solder. So that'll work out good for that. It recommends, in case you make an error, to have a vacuum desoldering pump, which we have. It fell on the floor and broke the end off a while ago, but it's still functional. Just got to watch it. Pinch your finger. Uh, any kind of pliers. I've got a couple springy set of pliers, which we got, so we're good to go there. Uh, hemostats, anything like that for clamping. These things I found at our local fair where they have them tent booths and some of the steam shows have them. These are invaluable for clamping and holding wires while your hands are full. And secondly, your side or your nippy cutters come in handy. And it also recommends to have like a magnifying glass which I mounted mine back to my helping hands. So in case I need it, it's there. I don't know if I will. When we get down into small intricate parts, I might need that. And lastly and foremostly, the transmitter kit uh, instruction manual. And I've also allowed myself a pad of paper over here that I can make notes during the build uh, in case anything happens to come up or I want to write down any quick notes. I've got a pad of paper here that I can uh, write my comments on. So let's introduce ourselves to the parts. Here's our circuit board. It's got all of our parts diagrammed out. Everything's that's resistors marked R, capacitors is marked C, transistors are marked Q. Uh, we have a couple microprocessors that write on here. They're marked U1 and U2. Uh, we have some jumper pins. They get marked here, here, jumper 1 and 2. Our audio in is marked J1. Our power is marked J2. Our shutoff switch is SW1 or audio level line in and the antenna. They're all marked. Everything's marked on here. They've done a very nice job of laying out the circuit board, I have to say. And here's our parts bags. This contains the microprocessors and the I, I should I keep calling them microprocessors, the, the IC chips, the integrated circuit chips. Our capacitors, a couple potentiometers, here's the crystal, uh, a few resistors in there. Over in this bag we have our on off switch we have our six foot antenna lead we have a few other they call these either chokes these aren't resistors they're chokes and they're very clearly stated in the book make sure you identify them per the collar bands and stuff they're a little bit fatter than a resistor so 
they, they kind of help you out too. We have our jumpers, we have our one transistor we need, um, our DC jack. So everything's there. So I'm going to shut the camera off and I'm going to get started on this and uh, I'll give you updates throughout the process here as we go along. I've got to say guys, uh, going through some of these components, this magnifying glass that they suggest, and I also suggest throwing in like a mini mag light or some kind of a, a portable light you have that you can kind of shine down through and look at some of your parts because these chokes over here are a pain to see the little lines on, at least for me. <laughs> I don't really have too bad a vision, I like to think, but uh, some of the oranges look like red, some of the blacks look like brown. So take my advice, I mean it's just, just you know, my opinion, use your light and use your magnifier, I know why they're there now. But the good thing is, we found everything, we went through, we checked it all off and stuff, and everything's laid out, I got all my resistors, my trim pot, my picofarad capacitors, my polystyrene capacitor, uh, some more picofarad capacitors, uh, 10K, these are actually 100 picofarad ceramic trimmers and then two small 10 microfarad 35 volt electrolytic capacitors and then all my other miscellaneous stuff the wire IC pins and the sockets and the chips and all that good stuff are in there so now we are almost ready to go I gotta read through a few more instructions here and uh, read any notes that they might have made and over here is where we start and it looks like they start with the brack brown green black quarter watt resistor so we'll get into that in a minute I'm going to read through all this phase one is resistors so I'll mount the resistors and a few other things and I'll be back to give you an update here in a few we are halfway done we are four phases out of eight complete in the first phase we installed all three of the quarter watt resistors the second phase we installed the jumpers which there's five of them and they are jumper one, two, three, four, I mean, there's five of them, I'm sorry. They're actually jumper one, two, yeah, three, four, five. So we got all of them. And next was the, the phase three was the non-polarized capacitors, which are disc capacitors. And they are 0 0.1 picofarad, which were these little guys here and here, C8 and 9. Got them in, got them tacked down. Next was the 0.1 picofarad ceramic capacitors. There's five of them, one, two, three, four, five. We got them in, tacked down. Uh, we had two 100 picofarad ceramic trimmer capacitors, which is this guy here and this guy here. We got them in, soldered down. And finally we had a polystyrene capacitor. It's a 510 picofarad. That's this little guy down here at the bottom right here. So where we're at right now, we have phase one, two, three, and one, two, and three done. We're ready to enter four. So we're not quite halfway there, I should say. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. <laughs> Next is the chokes, these little guys back in here. And we'll be really careful with them. Those fill up all these four spaces here, this space here, uh, these three places over here by the jumpers, those are all chokes. And that's pretty much it for the small inductor, you know, uh, installation except for like the electrolyte capacitors and the sockets for the ICs and whatnot. But right now where we set at, things are looking, I don't know how well you can see that in the light, let's move out here. Things are pretty well done. And I've taken this and faced any writing that's on these capacitors and faced them out towards the symbol on the board that the installation book calls out. So that way they're easily identifiable. You can see that C6 turned around here, C6 is a you know, is a point zero a 0 0.1 picofarad capacitor. Bam, it's right there, you can see it. What's wrong with me this morning? I'm caught up on a lot of stuff. <laughs> okay, that's where we're going to stop at for right now. About lunchtime, and take a small break, uh, take care of a few other things, and we will be back in just a little bit. 
All right, folks, here's where we're at. All the capacitors, the resistors, the uh, jumpers, and the trim pots, these variable capacitors right here have been installed. It looks pretty colorful now. We're getting some blues and some greens in here. And you really got to look at these identifying bands on these chokes, which is what these are. These actually look like big resistors, but they're a choke. There's seven of them, eight of them in this thing. And they're about double the size of a quarter watt resistor. So I went through there, but, uh, put, installed all that, flipped the board over, went under my handy dandy magnifying glass here and checked all my joints, clipped the leads, and it needed addressed, it was addressed, went back through and double checked in my book. And uh, once I went back through, as I'm soldering, I'll get done, I'll go back through and I'll check off the other column. You know, I went through there and checked it thoroughly. Now when we're done, I'll go through this whole board with uh, Q-tip and alcohol and clean all this old flux off. Uh, we'll want to look for any pieces of stray solder that might have popped out when we were soldering. Uh, any shorted pads, we'll, we'll clean all that up here at the very last thing. And just a side note for the guys that uh, restore the vintage radios, these leads are plenty long that I'm clipping off these capacitors and resistors and stuff. I mean, there's probably almost you know, a good two inches of lead there. I'll keep that. Those will be able to be soldered to capacitor leads or resistor leads that might not be quite long enough. Or we could use them for shunts or something like that in another project, but we'll keep a hold of those. We might might need those, just just an afterthought, but uh, hang on to that kind of stuff, it's always always useful. So right now, here's where we're at, and I'll be back for phase five, which is the ICs. Should be fun, I don't like doing them. The sockets kind of <laughs> are a pain to install because the pads are so close together and I ain't quite good at uh, soldering that close yet. I'll just be really careful with that thing, he can just tap that solder to it and check my joint. And you'll know when these start to go with the heat you know, coming down your lead to the pad, they'll start to look like water. They'll just get a little bit watery and you know, tap your solder and there it is. And with these, you got to be really careful. There's just less than a 30 second gap between every one of those IC pads. So you got to be really careful there and uh, make sure we don't get too sloppy with solder and go back through and thoroughly check these when we're completed. The Vectronics AM transmitter has now been fully assembled. After lunch, I hit her pretty hard. The power switch in, the ICs in, um, the antenna, put in the power jack, put in the uh, audio input, the audio line level adjustment, the two electrolytic capacitors. And now we're down to the part where I went through and checked the circuit board for any bad solder joints. Took it underneath of my magnifying glass with a real bright light and went over, touched up a few things I didn't much care for and dressed them up a little bit. Cleaned the whole board with alcohol, got rid of all that nasty flux and stuff that was just everywhere. And now it's time for testing and alignment. Um, this does not come, this uh, transmitter does not come with a power supply adapter of any kind. You basically have to supply your own power adapter. So for me, if I find it here in my stash of junk real quick. I'm going to use that old wall board I had. Uh, it's a multiple voltage power adapter. Find it here. I'm kind of unprepared for this part of the video, aren't I? <laughs> this is what I'm talking about here. A multiple voltage power adapter. This thing goes from 3 volts to 12, which we know in a previous video this thing's Output voltage is very inaccurate. It actually goes from about four and a half up to darn near, darn near 15 volts. So it's very inaccurate. But as long as it can put out a minimum of 300 milliamp and 12 volts, that's what this thing wants to see. But you can go down as low as nine volts on the power. So it tells you to pick a suitable power supply of your liking, whatever you have. and we go into the alignment section of this thing, which really is not a whole lot. Um, you can basically jumper, without a jumper you can go from 540 kilohertz to 870, 870 kilohertz with jumper number one, which is this guy right here, right here. 
it'll let you broadcast on 870 to 1420. Jumper number two right here will allow you to broadcast on 1170 to 1710. That's probably the one I'm going to use right there. I'll get into the higher frequencies. Probably around 16 to 17 tens where I'm going to uh, broadcast with this thing. And then we tune our antenna accordingly to where we want to broadcast with these three over here. If we don't use a jumper, our antenna is basically preset for best transmission upon 530 to 650 kilohertz. We don't want to be down in there. There's a lot of broadcast uh, stations around this area on there. Jumper number three which is this guy right here, will allow us to tune our antenna between 650 and 840. I don't really want that one there. There again is a, quite a few number of uh, stations in this area. Jumper 4 will allow us to go from 730 to 1400, but we're getting closer. Still a lot of stations in that area, especially at night. And lastly, jumper number 5, this is the one I think we're going to choose right here, will allow us to tune our antenna to 950 to 1800 kilohertz, which is a lot higher than the AM broadcast band. So I think what we're going to do, first off, we're going to power it up and see how it works on its non-jumpered status, which it tells you to do. And uh, once you find where you want to put your jumper at, what band you want to broadcast upon, then you start adjusting these little trimmer capacitors right here and fine-tuning it and dialing it in and getting it right where you want it. And if you have a frequency counter, it uh, suggests hooking that up for a little bit more accurate alignment to us. Uh, so if you want to be right on 910, put your frequency counter on it and then dial these two little trimmers in. You know, put it right where you want it to be because this is your broadcast and this is your antenna. And basically once you find your station you want to broadcast upon, no matter where it is on the AM dial, you're going to start tweaking this antenna trimmer capacitor right here for maximum distance away from your radio or whatever it is you're broadcasting to. And when you've reached that peak on that, then you're good to go. Again, like I said, this thing complies with part 15 of the FCC broadcasting regulations for a low power output transmitter. Um, they highly suggest you do not tweak with it to bring it over one watt. This is basically a one milliwatt output. Uh, do not mess with it to bring it up over one watt. They could be knocking at your door. So I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to have to deal with them. One of the nice things is too, once you get done with this, if I plug this in and it doesn't work. I can send it back to them. And they can they can troubleshoot it for me for eighteen dollars a half hour. Ain't that doesn't that sound good? Or if I've really loused this thing up and put things where it doesn't belong and it needs a lot more extensive repair, they can charge me a whole whopping thirty six dollars an hour to repair my kit uh, transmitter here. So that's why we went over it twice, make sure all of our solder connections and joints were good, everything was in its proper spot. The lead leads on the components were bent and were kept as low to the circuit board like the instruction says. Follow your instructions. That's what they're there for. So, you want to get the unregulated power supply here that's just out of control hooked up. And uh, we'll just leave it unjumpered for right now and see if I can broadcast to one of my radios down here and see what happens. So, stand by. There'll be more here in a few minutes. Alright guys, after some tweaking, I've set my wall ward up for 12 volts. Uh, it's actually around about 12.6 is what this thing wants to see. And under 12 volts you just get a real bad hum. So I would stay somewhere between 12 and 14 volts on this. But basically I strung my antenna up into the joist of the basement down here. And this is not set optimal by any means right now. But we are broadcasting to an AM radio on the other side of the bed, uh, the other side of the basement. So basically, I'm broadcasting Sirius at 91.9 FM and 1500 kilohertz megacycles, uh, kilocycles, I should say, AM. And uh, isn't that neat? <laughs> pretty slick so I'm gonna do some tweaking on this and set it for an optim optimal range and see how far this thing will actually reach and we'll put it upstairs and uh, plug the Sirius into it and start doing some range tests
Well, here's the finished product installed on a long wire. It's about six foot long on our second floor of our house. And I'm basically feeding the audio output of my Sirius into the AM transmitter and using that wall warp back here. You can't see it's kind of dark back in that corner up to the left that little transistor radio. And we're broadcasting. And we've got good audio out of this thing. I'm really impressed with the quality. And you know, this is one of them things that it built the way they said it would and it performs the way that they said it would. I'm really, really impressed with this unit. Very high quality. Um, very nice design, very easily built. And it's got a lot of functionality. Now let's go downstairs and I'll show you what this thing sounds like. It's pretty good. And then we'll do a range test around the property. Okay, so here's where my series has broadcasted for almost eight years at 91.9 FM. And you can see that we're tuned in FM stereo. This sounds pretty good. Here we go over to AM. I got a battery charger upstairs. It's got a little bit of noise in it. At number one this week. Here's Johnny Nash. Sounds pretty good. That, that's AM. There's FM. That is great. See, all the analog radios put me in right about 1500 on their dial, but we're actually, according to a digital tuner, broadcasting at 1480 AM, and that should be great. There's nothing around me that's on 1480 that I know of. Could be wrong, I'll have to do some DX in the night and see what might be around here. I don't think there's much of anything. So let's go do a range test with this thing and see what it does. I want you all to check this out at the end, because this is the way radio would have sounded like. This is a AT Casey Kasem's 40, Countdown 40, from uh, 1972 on AM radio. It's like it would have been back in the day. selling songs in the nation. You heard them on American Top 40, where we do our countdown every week at this time. Our list is from Billboard Magazine's weekly tabulation based on retail record sales all over the country. AT40 is produced and distributed by Watermark Incorporated. The producer is Don Bustani, and we take the show here in Hollywood. This is Casey Kasem. I hope you join me next week, and again, we'll count down the 40 most popular songs in the USA. Till then, keep your feet in the ground and keep reaching for the stars. Pretty neat, huh? Let's go do a range test. Okay, we're down in the barn. It's dark out here. I apologize. You can just barely catch it out here. I'm probably about 200 feet from the house. So we have our limitations, and that was to be expected, but for the whole house, I'm impressed. I'm happy with what I got. I'm going to do some more tweaking, and I about bet you if I move the thing outside, I'll be able to get even more than what I got right now. So we're going to go try a digital car radio and see how well that works. Well, it's definitely a go. We decided to settle upon 1460 AM right now. 
And if we don't like that, we can always adjust it and just kind of tweak the oscillator and the antenna to match and we broadcast on any station we want to as long as there's no interference or I'm blocking somebody that's legal. But this thing does have its range and it's a lot shorter than I thought it'd be. But it's good. It is really good. Um, from outside the house, I'd probably go in a radius of almost 20 feet around the outside of the house which at its max I'm probably close to 200 feet away from this thing so it does pretty good plus I'm on a second story uh, house, I'm in a second story house on the second floor I should say so that probably helps it too so I'm happy with this I'd love to get it off that wall warp because that uh, really provides a lot of extra hum it doesn't need to be there if I could build a uh, reliable 12 volt battery pack for this thing I would well, hopefully sometime this week the box should be here for this thing. We can put it in and then we can maybe see how much room we have around this thing. Maybe do something with a battery pack and see how long that lasts. That'd be great to make this thing completely self-sustainable and portable. Running off of a, you know, like a 9 volt or, uh, you know, it'd be kind of expensive to run it off of D cells, C cells, or A cells. Chop double A's I should say. I won't worry about that when we get there. I might be able to figure out something to make this work. I have to call up a battery maker and see what he has you can help me out with. And you're looking at the main reason why I bought that AM transmitter. You'll see in a future video what I'm talking about, but isn't this cool? <laughs> 60s music on a 50 radio on AM, 1460 AM. Well guys, I want to thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed this video that I put together of me building a AM transmitter. Like I said, the box should be in in a couple days, so I'll probably post another part to this. So Let's just label this part one and when the box gets here I'll put the, put the circuit board and all that good stuff inside the box and we'll make that part two. So for now guys, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video and there'll be more to come later.